When I was in Uganda, my favorite place was a place called King Fisher. It was this hotel, actually kind of more like a hostel, that overlooked the escarpment of Queen Elizabeth National Park. Below us was the savanna lands and forest, and you could see these elephants that would march through it. And then far in the distance, you see the ruins of mountains, which are the mountains of the moon. And they are they raised up to about 16,000 feet, and they're snow-capped. And we'd watch the sunset over them each night when we stayed there. I absolutely, whenever we could escape, would love to escape to that place. It's also a place where the most funny cultural experience ever happened when it happened. So we, so you have a little background. In Uganda, the language that we were speaking, you could interchange L's and R's, which for the most part is not that difficult to navigate. Uh, but I, I think of myself as being called Travis, but I was often called Gladys. I can't even pronounce myself. My daughter's Lillian, and her name was Ruberian. And, and they would say so beautifully, but I can't even get it out of my mouth. So one evening, we drove, driven up to the Kingfisher, <laughs> and uh, starving, hungry, well, not starving, it's really kids were there starving, but hungry and tired. And uh, we loved their fish. And they would give, they cook a whole fish with eyeballs, tails, heads, everything. And our kids would bet each other who could eat the first eyeball. <laughs> but we, so we got there, and I was hungry, and my English language I couldn't think very clearly, and I just wanted food. And so I ordered the fish, ordered a half fish for each of my kids off the children's menu. And I couldn't think of the word whole. So I said, I want a full fish. And, uh, you know, and the waiter looked at me and said, full? I said, yes, full. You know, head, tail, eyes, full fish. Full, yes, full, sure, yeah, sure. Full fish, full. Okay. So about an hour later, the waiter comes back and he places a half a fish in front of each of my kids. And then one plate, Two plates, three plates, four plates of whole fish in front of me. And I just looked at it and I looked at the waiter and he goes, Sir, you wanted full fish. <laughs> so people often ask me, what was it like to live in Uganda? Did you love it? And you know, it's a, it's a difficult response to give. But what I like to say is my life there was full. It was completely full. It was both full of awe of the amazing things and amazing people that we worked with, and all full of some of the things that we took a part of. But it was completely soul-stretching for me, and, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, when we came back and returning, I was so exhausted, I didn't know if I could ever go back to Uganda. We experienced amazing thrills, and part of, my, of who we are will always be in Banabuja, Uganda. And I want each of you, as you embark on this new journey, to have such a life, a life that is full, where, where your soul bursts with fullness of all that there is. And that in this monumental day, I pray that our time here together will give you courage to live a life that is both full, that you don't fear great sorrows, so that you can experience great joy. And you got to hot before you begin your speech, you have to start with thank yous. And so I do want to take a couple moments and just say thank you uh, to each of you for allowing me to be here. To Jeff Peck, who's taught me how to believe in the best of all people and to draw that out. <clears throat> Steve Holkauer, who uh, we spent a night together in the Valley of Boyas in the middle of Honduras, and our friendship has been sealed ever since. And he's taught me how to be loyal. Joff Jones, who taught me how to lead a friendship with love. Who taught me how to put other people first, even to your own detriment. Brian, Hodge, you're a constant encouragement. Everything that comes out of your mouth just makes me want to work harder. Rick, I need to learn. <laughs> and Heinrich Shaker has taught me how to, to give truth with compassion. She often pull me into her little office and residency and give me a good lecture. And I've learned a lot. And I'm not sure if I was scolded or encouraged at the end of it. <laughs> she did a beautiful job. Uh, Andy Morris, she's taught me how to be a consistent friend. Uh, and and Cowdery and Chin are here, and they taught me what was, how, how to love um, teaching. You know, and Teresa Freilich, how to choose joy. You know, they're just, each of you, I can probably go through stories and how thankful I am. And I, I and you got it, there also is another phrase. It's called all protocol, all protocol observed. 
And so when you're giving a speech and you might forget that chairman that you're supposed to say, you don't know his name, you just say, all protocol observed, and everything's absolved, and move on. <laughs> so, all protocol being observed, let us begin. I have entitled this speech, uh, A Perspective and a Blessing. A perspective on what is the fullness of life, and a blessing to give you the courage to embrace it. Four years ago, I received the most devastating news I think anybody could receive. But at that time, I had been married for 12 years, had an eight-year-old daughter, a six-year-old son, and a three-year-old son. I was working in my dream job in the middle of Africa, where I consulted in a pediatric hospital. We, taught, we treated typhoid fever, malaria, measles, cholera, pneumonia, sickle cell disease, all the zebras that you've always wanted to see, um, and severe malnutrition. We had 24 beds, but in the rainy season, these beds, we'd actually have 60 kids there. So they were sleeping on the floor, and in, in Africa, your family sleeps with you, and cooks right next to you. And so we had this, we probably had 120 people in a small little ward. And doing rounds was just stepping over IV poles and missing a mattress and jumping over a kid and uh, missing the food uh, just to get to the patient. So it, it at times was extremely overwhelming. But it was also rewarding. We would treat these premature kids. The malaria would cause a lot of premature births. And we had children underneath one kilo. And we would nurture them and teach kangaroo methods and, and spoon feed them breast milk and teach the women how to express the milk. And these little kids would go to be a kilo or even two kilos and go home in the arms of a grateful mother. We had kids come in with malaria, cerebral malaria, completely abundant. And we'd see the miracle of what oxygen and quinine and IV fluids can do. Very simple, but life saving. We would see. Um, Children come in bloated with or course, malnutrition, spent six weeks with us. Couldn't even lift their heads when they came in. And toward the end, they would just do rounds with me. I'd be my little doctor next to me. I loved, I loved all, all of the moments that we had in Africa. I really loved working alongside my friends. My daughter was known as the Ka doctor. Ka means little. So in the community, the Ka doctor would run around with me. So we spent, but we also wept often. We'd plead with fathers. I would plead with them, asking them, give me 24 more hours. Let me just get these IV antibiotics to work. Let me get the oxygen to sustain their life. It's going, they're going to and you turn the corner. But the belief, the cultural belief there, is that if you don't die on your family land, then your soul is lost and it wanders. And so they'd grab their children in the middle of the night and disappear. We would spend untold amount of hours arguing with hospitals in the Kampala, the capital, asking them to take one of our patients, and then going to the village and arguing with the families and saying, please, let's send your child with this trauma or this cancer so that they can receive treatment, only to be told that the travel, the expense, time away from the crops was too much. And besides, the curse that this child had, we couldn't break. So oftentimes, we were heartbroken. We also spent time running a boarding school, overseeing a gravity flow system, doing community outreach projects, spending time with these amazing pe people and developing great relationships. And, and of course, anytime I had a chance, go to Queen Elizabeth and spend some time at King Fisher. <laughs> uh, in October 2012, I developed our contracted hemorrhagic fever. It's a fever that's still not known. My blood sits in the arborium in Colorado with the CDC waiting for a name. I was purple head to toe, severe cramping, headache, vision troubles, and it was a rainy season, and our grass runway was flooded, so we couldn't leave the job. And the day number five, hemorrhagic fever has changed from either you know, this life threatening bleeding or dead or deaths. And so that night, I told my family I loved them, I would pray together, and went to bed. And the next morning, I woke without a rash, and without a fever, and completely filled with excitement and joy the new life that was given to me. Uh, unfortunately, I did develop some colonic uh, bleeding. We came back to the United States, had a colonoscope, uh, and the virus ulcerated a tumor that I had in the colon. And a few weeks later, I had the surgery, and the surgery revealed that I had colon cancer. Not only that, but that colon cancer had gone beyond the walls of my colon and throughout the body. And after the surgeon left, um, just the walls broke down, and I just started weeping. I had never met before. So this cancer adventure has given me a different perspective. And I want to share that perspective with you. But I have to warn you, 
my wife says this part's a little bit deep. And so a little bit of a shout out to Trick James. Uh, when I'm really kind of overwhelmed with cancer and thoughts about cancer, I kind of dive into astrophysics and I read a little bit of Brian Green or Eric Metaxas or Neil Tyson. And I'm just always amazed by the fragility on which our life exists. So the Earth rotates at a speed that allows weather patterns. Uh, and the, the weather patterns and temperature variations. Any slower, and we'd get too hot and too cold in the day and the night. Any faster, and we'd have chaotic storms surrounding the, surrounding the world. It sits on an axis that the degree on which it rests allows the seasons as it revolves around the sun. And that allows patterns of life, that allows life to exist, from the fall to the winter to the summer to the spring. The Venus Revolution, around the Earth uh, acts like a gyroscope and maintains that both the tilt and the rotation of the Earth. The, the ratio of the moon to the Earth and then the moon to the Sun is exactly 1 to 400. The uh, massive planet of Jupiter, the distances away from us allows it to attract asteroids and we would be bombarded by thousands more asteroids if Jupiter was not there. We need Jupiter. Our solar system is the Milky Way, and it's just like spiral galaxy. We sit on very far outside of it. Both the shape of the galaxy and our position in it allows the stars to pull and place forces on our solar system that allows the revolutions of the planets to stay in place where they are. And then our galaxy sits in the cluster of galaxies, and the pull and the push of these galaxies on each other allows the universe to expand. And it's expanding at a rate that's so fast that it prevents it from imploding on itself with other gravity and matter. But not so fast that it turns into this chaotic dispersion. So this amazing thing of life on this very planet that we live in, that we can stand in this very room, is actually pretty impossible. But let's look within. So that's the infinite. There's also this infinitesimal. What is lying within the ocean? And, and think about our bodies. We have this cardiovascular system, right? And my heart beats without me telling it to do so. Our blood vessels dilate and contract based on the need for oxygen or nutrition or, um, or the toxins that lie within. The uh, autonomic nervous system kicks in every time I stand up so I can walk. The eyes, this orbit of vitreous gel and, um, let me read it. It produces an image on the retina. There's, uh, there's cones and rods that's upside down, but these neurofibers have this chemical reaction that transmits electrical signal to our occipital lobe that flips that image and then interprets that image. Anything that's missing in your, in your vision will apply those gaps so that you have sight. And all those little parts to that system is necessary to be able to see. <laughs> what about the blood clotting, clotting cascade? 13 protein genes are necessary to keep us from hemorrhaging to death. But there's counter proteins <laughs> that keep us from clotting to death. And all of those are necessary for life. There's so many intricate, complex details and systems in our body that allows us to live. What about the Krebs cycle? Can anybody restore a cycle? You know, the RNA and DNA, the transcribing processes, and the correcting processes that allows it to do, go over and over a million times. I mean, it's just amazing that we're here. And then in those molecules, there's trillions of molecules in our body, are these little tiny vibrating strings, maybe, called quanta. In string theory, I have no idea exactly what it is. I'm talking outside right now. Like, whatever. <laughs> but it vibrates on a consistent vibration. It's like a chorus that holds together the entire universe. And so we have you know, these quanta, these molecules, these body systems, the, this Earth that lies on this axis and this rotation in the solar system on this galaxy in this universe. And when you do the necessary contrib contributory analysis on this, the likelihood that there would be a planet in our universe that has life at all is less than zero. But here we are. We are here with this fragile life at the crux of it, the meaning of the infinitesimal and the infinite. And we are given the gift to be caretakers of that life. We can bring wellness, cures, 
encouragement. We can meet the souls of, that are housed in these bodies, and we can give hope. And I want you to maintain this perspective as you graduate and you go forward, and to, to reflect upon it and to relish in it. And when you walk into that room to meet your patients, think about the fact that all that is bouncing within that human body. And when you watch your kids run around the backyard, think about all that maintains life. So that's the perspective I want to give to you. And it's this amazing responsibility that you have. And it's yours, and it's given to you today. So then the question begs, how do you go forward with this responsibility? How do you handle this gift? And that's the blessing. I want to bestow upon you an ancient tradition, which is called a blessing, which is a good word. But not just a good word, but a good word that's meant to empower you to go forward and to do good. So the blessing I'd like to give you to you is from the ancient scripture of Isaiah. Uh, and in the scripture, there's three principles. Three principles that I believe will, will guide you into a full life. It's the scripture that has taken me into the heart of Africa. It gives me joy when I treat my patients. And it gives me courage when I fight my cancer. It's the underlying motto and motivation for me with the School of Public Health. And if I have my way, I want to inscribe upon this walls. <laughs> the text is, what does the, the maker require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk on before you die? These three words in an ancient scripture are what the maker requires of us. Three words that I believe will allow you to navigate your oath and your calling. Three words that I think will give you resilience when you begin to question your calling. Three words to give you strength and courage to go forward anyway. And three words to move you into a life that is full and soul stretching. Justice, mercy, and humility. So justice is advocating for those who have no voice. Justice is why I went to Uganda and what we did. While we were in Uganda, there was a local man who contracted HIV. And he heard a rumor that if you defile a virgin, then your right HIV would be cured. And so he found an eight-year-old girl. And that eight-year-old girl, he raped. And he brought her to the health center. And I spent two hours treating her and sewing her back together. It was horrible. Probably the most horrible thing I've ever had to be a part of in my medical career. And I sat there praying over her and for her emotional healing as well as her physical healing. And then I got with the family and we marched to the police department. I did everything I could not bring justice myself to that man. A year ago, uh, my wife and I were sitting in a little restaurant in Hendersonville, and the owner, the, the uh, director of Safe Flight uh, Group, which oversees both uh, a ministry for battered children or children and women that are in domestic violence, and she said that she was trying to start a child advocacy center, which would treat children that had been abused. And I remember sitting there thinking I had a choice that sat before me. I could smile and say, ah. Oh, and then, and then she said, but we can't open it because there's no doctor that's willing to take that position. And I sat there thinking, I'm a doctor. And I don't want to take that position. <laughs> just put me in that line. And I had that choice. Like, do I just smile and say, well, I hope you find someone. Good luck. And I'll be thinking about it. About you. Oh, or do I take that position? And I knew I had the ability to treat and to care for those kids. And now we have a child advocacy center in Henderson. And it's been one of the greatest joys of my life. So in this world and in this community, people are hurting. They're sick and dying, whether we care about it or not. And this is justice. To do the right thing, even when you don't want to. There's always a need. And if you can meet that need, ask yourself, why would you not? Choose to do justice. Mercy is giving hope and a second chance to those who have enough. There was a very high prevalence of sickle cell disease where we live. The sickle cell trait, uh, trait rate was 60%, was basically indelible. Mm -hmm. uh, like it was just very prominent. Probably 10 to 15% of our children are born with sickle cell disease. There's a 98% child mortality rate of sickle cell disease in Sahara Africa. So none of them basically reaches, reach the age of five. Each of these children were not given a chance to go to school. They were given the last meal 
or they got to give them the last portion of every meal that they set out. The families cannot see a need to invest in this meal because they're going to die anyway. At best, they're seen as a burden. At worst, they were cursed and hopeless. And for three years, they bring them into my, cl my clinic or our hospital, dying of sickle cell crisis. And I'm just wondering, how, how do we treat this? How do we prevent this? Why are we not having this in America? What, what is the difference here? We're going to need to see. And basically, we came to the conclusion that the thing that these children needed most was to be seen as children. And so we st started a sickle cell club. And we invited these children to come and to play together, to draw and color and laugh and feel normal. And then we'd tell the, the parents, we'd teach the parents, what are some best practices to care for their children? And all these parents' children would leave with a whole new perspective and filled with hope. And that was my favorite program that we did in Uganda. There is always hope. We don't always know our patient's story, but they are, but they often come to our clinic hopeless or feeling helpless, feeling pointless, even some of them feeling cursed. And we can extend this hope to them, and that hope is often the begin, beginning of their healing. Humility, I believe, is defined by curiosity, faith, and great gratefulness. The best marriage counseling I ever received was by this old man in the VA hospital during my medical school. And you have plenty of time in the VA, you want to sit with your patient. So I asked him, like, you know, I'm newly married, do you have any advice? And he said, yeah, son, I have one advice for you. There can only be one crazy person in your house at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it's by far the best advice I ever received. And my wife and I often argue who gets to be the crazy one and who has to be the adult. <laughs> Uh, the second best is to be curious, though. We are infinite beings. There's so much to us. We're always changing and growing and developing. If we don't even know or understand ourselves, let alone the person that sits next to you. And the same for our patients. Be humble enough to ask questions, to get to know them, to seek to understand them, and never think too highly of themselves. The best lesson I learned in Uganda was from my, my friend Shem. He came up to me about three months into our stay there, and he goes, Doctor, I believe you're going to be a very good missionary. And I looked at him, and I was exhausted. You know, we've been working on this gravity flow system. I was trying to Google on, like, a dial-up speed, and how to unlock airlocks, air and I'm like, what is an airlock to start with? Uh, we, we developed a CPAP machine based on, like, a little bottle and bubbles and an oxygenator for our children with pneumonia in, in the hospital. We did, I did a lot of sitting with people. I would get up early in the morning and there'd be lions in front of our house, and I would sit with them and talk to them about school fees or, or job money or, or you know, what they need and how can we be a part of it. And we'd go to bed late at night doing the same thing. And it was just, it was exhausting. I, I mean, I pulled out a cockroach out of the kid's ear. You know, like it was just one thing after another after another. And, and so I, I, I needed a little encouragement, and I probably also felt a little too proud about what I was doing. So I looked at Shim and I said, Shim, Tell me, why am I going to be such a good missionary doctor? And he looked at me and says, because, doctor, your children suffer like our children. And I remember a couple weeks earlier, Aiden, our six-month-old, had contracted malaria. And I brought him to the church. And this little church that we stayed at and I just had nothing to say but, will you pray for us? And it was that moment that they received the most encouragement I think our family had ever get to. It was not the great programs. You know, it's not all these great things that we thought we were doing, but the fact that we live with them and suffer with them. And that's, you know, just to be shoulder to shoulder and brother to brother with those that, that are suffering. The most humbling experience of my life, and I'm about done here, the most humbling experience of my life was when I heard the three words, you have cancer. And for the first time in my life, I realized I was completely out of control. There's nothing I could do about it. it I, um, you know, the, the story of my life had been hijacked. I had all these great plans, and they all came to a halting stop. And, but I, and I wanted to ask, and I did ask, you know, why me? Why now? I'm a good man. I've been doing good things. I'm young. I'm healthy. Why, why me? But then I thought about my friends in Uganda and how they lost their children, and how they lost their fathers. This is a broken world. There's no room for me to ask, why? Now, I often ask, why now? You know, and I ask that a thousand times a day. But not why me. 
because we all are in this world together. This world is beautiful, but yet it's also broken. And so we walk in this together. Uh, and I'm realizing through this chaotic walk of being in a life that's uncontrolled that I can't save myself. I need something greater than myself to be able to navigate, something to hold on to, something to anchor me. And so my faith is greatly deepened during this time. And I want to challenge you in all humility to do the same, to nourish your soul, to explore your faith, so that when life is hard, when it becomes chaotic, that you have this anchor that you can hold firmly to. Now there's many nights that I have woken up and was overwhelmed by what the next day might bring. And darkness feels heavy. And during those times I've learned that gratefulness is the key. And I begin to recite things that I'm thankful for. And I believe gratefulness is what humility is all about. Not that I deserve anything, but I have been given so much. And to recite those grateful things I'm grateful for, a light begins to dawn within my heart. And I begin to think, okay, tomorrow I can, I can handle it. And so curiosity and um, curiosity and, and gratefulness and let's see. What is it? Faith. Thank you. To find you in place. So guys, there, there is always going to be need. There's always going to be hope. And there's always something to be thankful for. So I am grateful for every part of this life that I've been given. And I want to take this last few couple minutes and charge you with this blessing. As you took your oath when you graduated from medical school, before your maker and before your family, before your colleagues, so now I give you this blessing before your maker, before your family, before your colleagues, that your life may be filled to the fullness. So go and do justice, love mercy, and walk home. May your career, may your life be defined in fullness, and your career be defined by justice. May relationships be pervaded with mercy, and may your life's path be shown with humility. Thank you guys, and God bless all of you, and I'm so grateful for you, and I look forward to hearing where this night is.